Hey there. When I was a wee little boy, I didn't really play online multiplayer. I wasn't putting hours into Call of Duty or Battlefield. My first shooter was Plants vs. Zombies Garden Warfare. So now that I'm older and I play a lot more of these multiplayer shooters, strategy games, and so on, I don't really feel very blinded by nostalgia. In fact, I find I can sometimes be overly critical of these games because I lack the proper emotional connection. One of the most fun parts of these games is your own investment, and because I don't have the years of history backing me up, I can sometimes lack that investment needed to truly enjoy the game to the fullest. That being said, I currently feel the online multiplayer market is pretty weak and has much room for improvement. For that reason, I'm going to look at some of the problems that are, in my opinion, plaguing the modern gaming industry and even offer some possible solutions. The first thing I want to talk about with online multiplayer is systems. Every game you make is built on a system, aka there is some certain way a player should play the game. On the most basic level, the system is merely the objective of the game. In some Overwatch rounds, pushing the payload, or planning slash disarming the spike in Valorant, the underlayer of the systems are much more complex though, and this revolves around the path the developers take for their players to reach those objectives. Going back to Overwatch, the way the players can move the payload are varied. The easiest is just standing on the load itself, but most choose to go out and get kills. Teams without the payload may not retake it immediately, hoping to group up and use that to their advantage. While the center goal is the same, the varied ways a player can achieve those goals is actually the important part of the system. This is where a lot of current games falter, even though they are packed with more things than ever before. League has over 140 champions at time of recording, Rainbow Six Siege has 78 operators, and Valorant has 24 agents. While these games are filled with options for the player and how they fulfill the objective, I generally find in these games that variety is stifled out from other parts of the system. To look at this, I'm going to focus on Rainbow Six Siege and how a lot of matches in these games can be quite repetitive. Oregon is the most popular Siege map, and for good reason. It's a pretty well-designed, defender-sided, safe bet map in a game where most players want to minimize risk. Minimizing risk is something a player will always want to do. I'm going to mostly focus on the attacking perspective, as it'll show the issues best. So on the first round of Oregon, defenders 99% of the time are going to choose the second floor bomb site. This bomb site is usually the safest bet for a defender in securing a win. Now, with this bomb site, attackers are most likely to choose to enter from one of these two points. The question that arises is, with so many options, why do players only enter in through these two areas? Well, the answer comes back to before. Siege is a very punishing game. With one-shot headshots and low time to kill, players are scared of trying new things, because often, trying new things results in death. So players choose to just go through one of these two entrances. Some changes do take place, but rounds definitely blend together. This bomb site, probably one of the most popular in the game, illustrates an issue with the way Siege's system is designed. Siege's system is designed to provide variety through operators, but when your players don't want to experiment because the other systems are so punishing, everyone will just funnel to the same way of attacking every time. Variety is great, but that system will only work if your players want to experiment with that variety. When talking live service games, there's only one true live service game that does it great. Fortnite. The monetization of video games has changed a lot since Fortnite came out. In 2016, Overwatch came out for $60. Once 2022 rolled around with Overwatch 2, that game was released for $0. What changed? What did Fortnite do? Live service is a very interesting form of online multiplayer. It assumes that while the game should have a good base on release, the game will be built upon over time. They release a game to try and get money from players in order to have money to continue developing the game. To buy a cosmetic, the player has to believe they'll continue playing the game. The longer the game lasts, the more emotional connection to those cosmetics the player has. Also, the developer's game is just going to get better over time as these cosmetics can fund the creation of new features. Fortnite has done this perfectly. The original Fortnite is fun, but I wouldn't call it amazing. It certainly doesn't explain how the game has stayed so culturally relevant for six years. Fortnite really utilized that initial hype to fuel future developments. Besides that weird slog during Chapter 2, the game has basically been constantly changing since its release. This is of course supported by Fortnite's crazy monetization strategy, which at a certain point is becoming a selling point of the game itself. Now we have LEGO Fortnite. So the question is, with live service gaming basically being an infinite money glitch for both money and content, and Fortnite being able to be used as a perfect example, why do so many live service games suck?
Oh my god. Oh my god. There are too many live service games. Every game that ever had an ounce of popularity is now live service. Halo, Overwatch, Destiny, and in my opinion the most hurt, Call of Duty. What the hell is Activision doing? Why is this game still $60? Most developers seem to look at live service and think of it more as a method for free dollars than an actual change in the way they develop their game. Live service games requires consistent updates which change the game, and those updates also have to be good. You're making the players put constant money into the game, and those players want something in return. Your players are basically investors, and like investors, they want to see their investment returned. For Call of Duty, you can't just make your game live service while still releasing a new game every year. For your players to get a proper return on investment, the games need to last longer than that. Your players have to be provided with content that you're able to add because of cosmetics. Otherwise, you are going to make your player base mad. Overall, live service games are hard to do. You can't just add a bunch of paid for cosmetics. Your players have to be provided with the content that you're able to add because of those cosmetics. It's establishing trust, and most players just don't trust gaming studios. Why, you might ask? Balancing is a very hard thing to do. No matter what decision you make in terms of nerfs, buffs, reworks, or just giving up altogether, someone is going to be mad at you for it. That being said, I think many developers have the wrong philosophy when it comes to balancing their games. Okay, so most critique of game balancing is usually going to focus on characters that are overpowered rather than underpowered. An underpowered character is pretty useless, but they don't create instant harm to the systems of the game. An overpowered character can send a game to purgatory almost instantly. Smash Bros. illustrates this with Bayonetta for Wii U and Steve for Ultimate. If you ask most players of these games, I don't think Wii U players exist, but if they did, they would probably be more focused on nerfing these characters than buffing the underpowered characters. Now, an unintended fact of this is player perspective, and regarding how players view balancing updates. When asking my friends whether Siege nerfed or buffed operators more often, they all replied, Okay, do you guys think Siege nerfs the game more or buffs the game more? Nerfs. Nerfs? nerfs. Alright. Nerfs. But the truth is, looking at the two most recent big balance updates to Siege, there are definitely more buffs than nerfs. But the operators being nerfed are also the operators people actually play. It's a case of sampling bias, where most players aren't remembering the full skill of the patch, but rather the change that impacted most. Those changes are usually nerfs. In the same way that there are probably more underpowered characters than overpowered characters, but people care more about the overpowered characters than they do the underpowered ones. So what should developers do? Well, nerfs are obviously still necessary, but maybe nerfing the best characters in the game isn't the best decision. You see, I think this constant nerfing of the best characters has a pretty negative side effect. To illustrate this, let's create a bar graph of 8 characters, each one slightly more powerful than the other. Now players are naturally going to gravitate towards the strongest character. Having strong characters lets you win, and winning is fun. Therefore, strong characters are fun. Now, this first character is too strong, so let's nerf them, and in turn let's buff the weakest character. Let's repeat this process for all the characters until we have a flat graph, which is basically the average of each character's strength. Now this is a balanced set of characters, but evening out the graph like this causes the issue of player perception. To a player who is playing only the characters above this average, the characters are going to look weaker than before. So while the worst characters are buffed, no one was playing them anyways, so no one notices. All people notice is the operators they were winning with, having fun with, are now nerfed. So how do we fix this? Of course, we want a balanced game, but if players aren't enjoying this perfectly balanced game, then what's the point? In my opinion, the hope would be to raise the average, embrace the fact that strong characters are fun to play, and try to make each character strong in their own way. And this doesn't just apply to characters, it can apply to weapons, abilities, or anything a player has control over. Balance your game, but keep it fun at the same time. So, I've been pretty critical during this whole video, and I feel like no critique is truly finished without showing what steps need to be taken in the future. Well, during December, this game called The Finals was released. You may have seen its release trailer during the Game Awards. Anyway, I've been putting some hours into this game, and I think its foundation is really great and something to follow, specifically in terms of the game's system. The way The Finals prevents repetitiveness is through one simple gimmick, destruction. Most walls, roofs, and floors on the map are destructible. This makes the game also feel varied, and not just because the player has to seek variety either. Variety is naturally created as the players fight across the map. Destroying things is a means of reaching the objective. 
and the objective itself isn't varied either. It's pretty standard every round, but the means of reaching that objective is what changes so often, and what makes the game's system so fun. Now, can every game create variety through destruction? No. But what every developer can do is look at how the finals encourages variety passively through its systems, instead of its very systems hurting the variety it tries to create. The finals understands this, and it's why my initial reactions to this game are so positive. The game is live service, and just released its first balance patch. So far, no clear indications that they are doing the other things I preach in this video, but we'll see in the future. What I will say though is that if you have not given the finals a try, I would really recommend it. It's a lot of fun. If developers look towards games like the finals for future inspiration, we could see a resurgence in the online multiplayer sphere. Overall, when you're playing a game, what more can you ask for than fun? And if the finals provides that, we should look at how it provides that and try and emulate that. Because overall, what we want most from online multiplayer is some fun games. Uh, Kyle, we might have to go help, bro. Nah, I'm on jump, I'll be fine. I know! 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 I